Hi there everybody and welcome to the first in a series of interviews I'm really really excited about um, with Alicia Lavoy and we're going to be doing interviews and finding out more about Selkies and the myth of Selkies. So here in this first interview with Alicia we're going to be looking at the Selkie myth, what is a Selkie and where the myths come from. Hi there Alicia, how are you today? Hi, I'm doing good, thank you. Fabulous. Um, thank you very much for, for doing this interview with me. I'm really, it's a subject I'm really fascinated in and I think a lot of people out there are going to be really fascinated too. But I've been speaking to some people and a lot of people I know, even in the spiritual world, don't actually know what a selkie is. So would you mind explaining your take on what a sel selkie is? Not a selfie, a selkie. <laughs> um, selkies are mythological creatures found in Scottish, Irish and fair OC folklore. Uh, they're more common in the Orkney Isles, which is an island chain in northern Scotland. Um, as I learned what the word means, basically Selkie is Orkney dialect for seal. So they are said to live um, as seals in the sea, but they shed their skin um, to become human on land. Uh, in human form, Selkies are often depicted with uh, raven hair, chestnut eyes and uh, very fair skin and there's a beauty about them but it's not that Hollywood glamorous beauty that we see it's a beauty that comes from being connected to the land and by dissecting that connection you're taking a huge aspect of who these uh, beings are away from them so um, in a way they would be living a half-life if they are disconnected from their seal skin or from uh, being whole. That's yeah. the best way of describing a selkie. Thank you, absolutely. And I think there seems to be lots of myths about this in Scotland and where the Orkney Isles, Scotland and um, Ireland as well, as, as you as you said. And it's a really interesting thing because each myth, wherever you look at, in the Faroe Islands as well, and around and about, there's always a story of this um, beautiful woman or handsome male, and the stealing of the skin is there every time. It's never just there's a woman and um, she turns into a seal. It's always the possession, isn't it? And the possession of the skin and the, the desire to possess that wildness or that skin, which always seems to happen. It's like people can't resist it. And it's quite harsh, really, but it also always causes trouble, doesn't it? In, in every myth, it never goes, oh, that'll be all right, then you'll steal my skin and it'll all be fine. No, it doesn't work that way. Also, it might be the, um, the times when the myths were told. Um, I know, and this is going to be further integrated as we uh, go along with this series of videos, but um, at the time, that whole concept of possessing someone, um, it's almost like they were looking for something within themselves, but they were looking outside themselves in order to get it. So to do so, they possessed another being. Mm -hmm. um, the stories as I know them, um, the male and female role, um, vary. For instance, male selkies are described as being gorgeous. And uh, they often seek out um, uh, fishermen's wives and bring them into the sea to be their wives. Um, does it always work that way? No, because if the wife the desired wife doesn't have a silky skin, how can they live in the water? So there is that death aspect. Um, the story, as I'm familiar with it, was told to me by my maternal grandmother, who is first generation um, American of Scots-Irish descent, now passed. Uh, but she told me the story of the seal maiden and the fisherman. And uh, the selkie would be on land, uh, her skin next to her, and she would either be dancing or fast asleep. And the fishermen would happen upon her and sneak up and steal the sea, seal skin. So um, what would happen was that possession, she was now his. So she became his wife. She had their children and tended hearth and home. Um, but she was always wanting to go home to the ocean, always seen longingly gazing at this place because she felt some part of her was missing. So usually what would happen is the first child, a girl, would inadvertently find the seal skin and return it to the mother not knowing what it is. She would return to the sea. Um, so there's that leaving of uh, the family, the husband, and the leaving of the children. So 
where do we go from here? How there is that uh, the Selkie is no longer the same being it was because it lived it. Not only does it have its home in the water, but it also has lived on land. So there's the marriage of uh, the water element, uh, the earth element from living on uh, land, um, the breath, and also um, the animate spark within the Selkie fire. So she has been changed. Um, that's how I've learned it. And my grandmother always gave me an interesting gift. She would tell me at the end, just remember my little wild Selkie, you can change the story. So that um, from the past as that whole concept of possession to learning to integrate all the aspects of the Selkie to now. So it's almost like reshaping the myth into um, blending it with our society today. So. Yeah. So not to interrupt you, I'm just, it's really, it's just really, really, really interesting. Yes, it is very interesting. So um, that's how I know the legends. Um, a more current take on it, The Secret of Rowanish, which is based on, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book, <laughs> which is not coming to mind. Um, and there's we'll also... It, we'll remember, we'll put it in the notes. Yes, excellent. Uh, and there's also that new animated film, which uh, I believe you know the title of? Yes! I do! I know! It's not coming to mind! It's just beautiful animation. I think it's... I, I just... Um, I'll put the, we'll find out the details and put it in, in the notes, definitely. And I, I think that just looking at the trailer for that animation and just... Mm -hmm. it, it really invokes the beauty of the and the innocence of the Selkie myth, and because seals, I mean, back to, to to the seals, they have this kind of emotive eyes, don't they? They have this innocence and beauty, and they seem to express so much in their eyes. And I think that seems to be um, what the sad, not the sad part of this is. I think it's more of um, how it's been portrayed in the past. Like you said, we have the power to change these myths or to recreate or to forge our own myths now. But looking at the past stories, it was always that sadness of being torn between the wild sea that you love, and as it read, it was sort of saying that you know, no matter how much you love your family, no matter how much you love your husband, when the sea calls and you have your skin, you have to follow that. So it was a, it was a force stronger than rationale, isn't it, really, and a force stronger than connection. But then the Selkie will return to the sea and see her children and her husband when she's in her seal form, and then the sadness is there too, because you, in, in, in the past myths, because she couldn't have that life, or she'd let go of that life. Um, I think the innocence and the emotion of the seals and, and their eyes comes across so well in that animation, Tales from the Sea, or something like that, or whatever it's called. Um, we'll put it there. Um, it just shows that beauty and that torn energy of the wildness of the sea and being able to um, have that wild self. But I think that seals are just such an amazing vessel for this um, story, aren't they? Because you know they may not be um, beautiful maidens, but they have such human or or beautifully feeling eyes, and I think people really connect with that. Maybe the fishermen, the sailors, when they were out at sea, they really connected with the eyes of, of the seals. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think it's the Atlantic gray seal that's common in um, the water surrounding the Orkney Isles. They have such human eyes, and um, the settlers of that region probably had a tendency of characterizing them in such a way and connecting with them on a human level. Um, whether you describe them as mermaids with seal um, tails or the selkies themselves shedding the skin and coming to land as human, there is that human quality to them. Um, also, we have a tendency, Laura, of living in a society where we think from an either-or perspective. Is it possible to have that wild self um, and also, which is a completely foreign concept, being able to integrate that into society. Mm -hmm. Because um, I know within my own maternal line, for instance, um, my the female lineage, especially very strong women, very connected to the land, healers in their own right. Um, my grandmother was a good example. Uh, she was a nurse. Um, and not only that, she was a mother and took care of her... Um, two children before my mother was born um, le uh, much later in 1949 but she was um, going back to school for nursing she was taking care of her husband and helping out around the house plus uh, taking care of kids and um, educating herself and trying to 
combine both aspects and there were times when mother would um, that needed to come through and there were times when wife needed to come through and there was times when nurse needed to come through but um, she somehow managed to incorporate all aspects of herself it was not she was a mother or she was a nurse or she was a wife it was she was a mother and a wife and a nurse and found ways to integrate this to the best of her ability. At times, um, she did lose herself in the care of others, so there were still aspects that she was trying to. Um, yeah, she was. There were still aspects she was trying to fully um, immerse into herself. And uh, I think what she meant by that comment to me at the end, no matter what, you can change the story. Um, is it possible to fully integrate your full selkie? sovereign uh, selkie self and live in the world, walking the line between wild soul and living in our society and the answer is yes, definitely. It is not an either or because if you deny that wild part of yourself in honor of walking someone else's path or what society deems is right for you, you are living a half life, you're pushing that part of you down. But if you deny um, the fact that we are very much a part of the human world and raise that wild part up, we're also living a half-life um, and not fully integrating who we are. So, um, I know personally how that has integrated within my life, um, and I know I'm getting personal, but uh, this is a good example. Um, when I was 24, I was in a very abusive relationship, which ended in 2007 with his uh, death in a car accident. And he tried everything possible to push me down, but I was also denying that wild aspect of myself uh, because I was afraid that he would not love me. So uh, I was living a half-life. Um, and in the process of my healing journey after his uh, passing, I learned a great deal about myself, realizing that I cannot... Um, ignore that part of me. I am a um, caregiver, I am friend, I am sister, I am deaf midwife, I am writer. Um, I'm, and th those are aspects that are all a part of me that I'm trying to fully integrate into my life. So the archetype of the Selkie coming through and um, reclaiming my whole, um, full seal skin, yeah. It's definitely it is possible to do. Um, well, thank you. That's a um, huge thank you so much for sharing that, and that's a really personal, deep story as well. Thank, and I think we'll definitely go more into that. We've got loads to do in the future, haven't we? About integration, it's going to be a really powerful. I feel a really powerful subject to work on, and I think we've got other plans for other interviews, and other ideas for the future for this integration. This is going to be huge, I think, and really, really, really powerful. And as you said as well, like this was a matter, these were, the tales are recorded at a certain time, and at a certain time, it wasn't their cool woman to be wild, it was very repressed. So, as you say, the myths are, oh, they're pushing and they're pulling and they don't quite work out and they don't quite fit and they don't quite gel because everything inside a woman was not fitting and not gelling. There's oppression into housewife and you'll do everything in the house. We know you've got a wild self, but we're stealing that wild self from you. And also as well, the um, the male, the masculine self, is well, it's not just the women that have done bad from this. Um, I was like, I was reading about the masculine selfie, selkie, and how they, um, you know, how they rescued women. And I think this is an interesting one about the hero and the, the the energy of the hero's quest and the power of the masculine has also been diminished as well. So I find that selkie brings out those parts of ourselves that are repressed, and hence the the stories have been written down in the past in a time that we don't live in now. Kind of, I feel I'm happy about that in that society where women have to be the good housewife, etc. Um, some rubbish at cooking and washing up and that. Um, but I, I think I think that as you say, and your grandma said that we're in a different time now where the Selkie myth lives on and is absolutely relevant and can be reclaimed. That you can be this lover, this passionate fighter, this giver, and also uh, maintain healthy relationships with people. Yeah, um, I know another way of looking at it would be uh, from Carl Jung's analytical point of view, the yeah. integration of the animus and anima. Uh, for instance, um, each a male has, a, I believe it's called the anima, where um, they have their inner female and the uh, 
women have their inner animus, which is their inner male. So it's like the integrating of both male and female aspects. Granted, um, that uh, definition would be based on from a societal bias of what we consider male and female qualities within our society. But I think when you when it comes down to is rather than um, holistically separating them, it's just the integration of um, nurturer and warrior, integration of um, aggression and um, being able to stand up for yourself. I mean, we're all human. We all have that inner, those inner um, aspects, whether um, nurturer in some societies might be deemed more male, while um, warrior was deemed more female. The point is full integration. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, absolutely. And what do you feel, I mean, I find that the Selkie's relation to the sea is obviously, obviously, you know, the wild call of the sea, but that the sea can't be tamed, and the aspect of what sometimes the sea, you know, how people their relationship with the sea to know, you know, to see that they would be aware that the sea would give and would give life and would give um, fish and would give things, but also would take away. And so, do you feel that the Selkie's relationship with the sea and the Selkie's dualistic nature? Is all is all linked in? Is all about how they view this this being, this creature, this aspect. Uh, the sea, the metaphor between the sea, uh, the selkie and the sea, um, it's perfect because um, it does. They do give and take. For instance, um, you see it in the myth. I will use the example of the seal maiden. Um, the um, the selkie maiden does give as a wife. She does give. Um, bear and uh, help raise the children, and she does tend hearth and home, but when her, um, she's called back to the sea, when her first child finds her seal skin, it goes back, so there's that give and there's that take, it's the ebb and the flow of the tides, um, it's the ebb and the flow of uh, the wildness in us and also our link to society, so um, we cannot have too much of something, so it's that give and take, it's perfect. Um, because if we give too much, we're not honoring yourself. But if we take too much, we're not honoring um, those around us. So uh, yeah. the ebb and flow of the ocean is a very good metaphor for um, and the Selkie's uh, relationship with it. And also, thank you. And I was also looking at some of the myths, and um, there was a tale where there was four brothers or four friends, and they each found a Selkie, and they each dealt with this situation quite differently. You know, it was one brother hid the skin and lost his wife because she found the skin and he went off. One, one very sad that one brother burnt the skin and the, the Selkie was so distraught she threw herself into the fire. Um, and then so the other brother um, got the hang of it a bit more and really genuinely he was the one that seemed to respect the woman a lot more and said, look, I don't want you to be sad, have your skin. And they managed to maintain a relationship that sometimes she'd be on land and sometimes she would be on the sea and it seems to be the balance and the respecting of each other's boundaries and as you said not taking too much not being too selfish not saying oh, you know when you when you want someone so incredibly and you just want to possess them and hold them and that is not respecting their boundaries or their their space and it's an interesting because the sea is so wild and the emotions are so wild it's it's a really interesting way about how we can navigate our own emotions do you think as well yeah, definitely. Um, there's a good example, modern example. Um, Iona Lee, she is a um, harpist and singer in Scotland. Um, she was connected with the Finhorn Institute. Um, she wrote a song called The Selkie, and it talks exactly about that uh, latter example of, yes, I will be on land with you, but when my time comes, I need to return to the sea. And um, the fishermen would... Um, visit with his selkie wife when she was in the sea and they would ha there was that give and take where she would be on land um, in human form and when it was her time to go back to the sea the fishermen would um, visit her by um, going out to in his boat at an appointed time and um, there was that give and take which is in perfect in a relationship yeah. there is that give and take so um, the sea the connection with the sea um, as the medium that depicts that relationship and the actual um, story of the Selkie and uh, the fishermen, especially in a modern context, for an example of um, the ocean and how we should, it doesn't always work out that way, uh, <laughs> respect those around us, but also make sure we respect ourselves as well. 
that's the key, isn't it? And that's the first, the first step. And I think we'll definitely talk about that a lot more in the sovereignty and the aspect of the Selkie integration, which will be a, another interview, which I'm looking forward to as well. Um, so your family, as you say, uh, your maternal line has a real link to Selkie. Did they spur on your interest of Selkies when you were young? Um, did they tell you tales? Um, so I know that there's tales of obviously Selkies and humans having children and that lineage living on. Um, and that's a nice, lovely, beautiful, powerful idea. Um, is this how, how did it start for you? Did your family tell you these stories when you were young? Uh, yes, my family, my grandmother told me these stories when I was young, and uh, ba based on the family myth, um, her mother told her these stories, and her mother's mother told her mother the story, so it was kind of passed down. Um, what's interesting within the um, Celtic folklore, um, myth and actual history are not separated hence mythopoetic um, background. So according to my family um, line, uh, we are descended from a Selkie and a fisherman. Um, where? I don't know, but that's as it was passed down. And do I necessarily believe I was, uh, in fact, related to a seal and I'm going to have kids in the future that resemble seals? No. Um, I what? <laughs> Interview over. <laughs> I'm joking. But the whole concept, the whole theme seems to very much swim and integrate itself in, into my family line and um, how the women have lived, making sure to honor that wild self but also making sure to live within society. However, in um, more of the recent generations, um, I would say not necessarily my grandmother's, but um, because of the way society viewed women in the way of um, they're here, men here, there was that uh, we need to get married, so there was that squashing of um, the wild self. So that fight to maintain who they are without losing themselves, um, I guess that's another reason why my grandmother told me just remember you can change the story. Um, so. Definitely, definitely. Um, another, another thing I wanted to, to, to ask you and mention is um, was a, lady, a lovely lady I know. She's kind of the modern sulky thing as well. She lives in Scotland. Her name's Hannah Titania. And she's a lovely lady, a lovely girl. And her mum, um, they live in a little island off the coast of Scotland and um, they look after the seals a lot. And what happens with Hannah and with her mum is that they play the violin or the cello or a musical instrument and the seals actually come in. Um, from the sea and come and sit with them, and it's just really, really beautiful. It's just the way she was brought up, it's just, it's just a beautiful story. Um, and she has some books as well. I should share the links to, to Hannah's books. But um, uh, the link to music and song, and the song of the sea. I think that's what that animation's called. I think I've got there in the end, in a roundabout way. Um, the song and the song of the sea, how the sea would sing to seals, and how music is intrinsically linked into the Selkie myth as well. Is that something you found and discovered as well? Uh, yes, um, definitely, because I grew up with music in the house um, as a way to express emotion, as a way to um, connect with uh, the land. It was almost like um, the playing of the instrument or vocal, um, vocally singing um, and the land coming together. The product music was uh, expression of that um, connection. So... Um, Vocal and instrumentation, for instance, uh, very prominent in my family. My grandmother, for instance, uh, fiddle, um, ukulele, guitar, <laughs> piano, and organ. And um, it's very typical in my family line to have multiple talent with instruments and vocals. So, yes. I know you sing as well, don't you? You've been doing some beautiful singing as well. Yeah, I've been uh, big. Except for I grew up with uh, the music, yes, and I was in my school's marching band, and I also play piano now. Um, but yes, I've been opening up and expressing more um, vocally. Perfect. And that's uh, most a healing thing as well, isn't it, to do? Yeah. Most recently in my work as a deaf midwife um, for a client's uh, memorial service. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, very powerful. Um, can I ask something, um, which is probably seeming to be really obvious, but 
for people who are very new to this or really fascinated, um, what would you say would be really good ways for them to connect with the energy of Selkie within themselves or in the wild? It might seem obvious, but um, what would be a good first step that you would advise to people? I would say go to areas where they are known to um, uh, reside. Um, naturally, that would be hard for those who are who do not live near the coastline. But uh, try to immerse yourself in an environment um, so you can get an idea energetically of um, and physically of the connection with the land. So while you might not necessarily um, come into contact with a seal or sea lion, a very close relative, um, getting an idea of the ocean and that connection to the ocean is one step uh, because the ocean is a very big part of the Selkie myth and the Selkie um, themselves. It's like it's part of their soul. Um, I hesitate to say go to an aquarium to get to know the um, seals because um, that's more in captivity and while you might get a meaning of what their um, wild self's like, um, not exactly the same thing. So um, for those who don't live near the coastline, which is kind of hard for me to pass on this information to them because I have access to the coastline. Um, I'm not that far from Long Island Sound, um, that area where, specifically where um, the Atlantic Ocean and Long Island Sound meet. Um, it's a very liminal place. Um, I would say find out as much as you can, um, research online um, or speaking with someone you know about um, seals, uh, their habitats, um, and then go on a journey, which I know we're going to go more into in a second video about integration, for instance, um, and see what comes up. And also, put the intent out there in your dreams. I call this um, dream, um, it's more dream work. Set the intention. I would like to meet a seal and um, as my guide, also making sure to call in your guides to make sure that uh, you are indeed protected um, and see what they have to show you. Amazing, absolutely. And you can always do that in the bath time as well, couldn't you? Like um, yeah. have a nice little ritual bath and set up a lovely space, calling your guides, protect, and then ask to be shown um, that side. Yeah. You can also so, create, um, within um, in a bath. You can um, create salt water. And put uh, in that way. So, not exactly close to being in the wild with the seals, but still. You know, we try. We, you know, yeah. it, it, it's the intention as well. But yeah, definitely, if you can. I mean, I always remember just going down to Cornwall um, and just being on the wild, rugged coast there. And that's where I get my total. Yeah, so I remember being at Tintagel um, Castle, which is like a really rugged castle by the sea, and um, just the call of the sea and the wild, they were so strong, and I was just standing there feeling it, and this little seal popped its head up, and I was just like, yeah, that's it. There's, it's something that just resonates so deeply in our souls, doesn't it, in our blood, you know, it's we're made of, we're from the ocean, and uh, we do get called back, I think that's just one of the most beautiful things, and I love the fact that with the Selkie myth as well, you have so many different things that... Um, has connotations too, like you say, the sovereignty, the world self, is a kind of um, innocence. I kind of find a very childlike innocence of being back to the sea as well. And then I think with the romance, there's always love involved with these selkies and the discovery of your own romantic and emotional self by the taking of the skin. And it's just, yeah, it's just got so much to go, so, so many places to go, hasn't it? And um, I know one point to definitely pull in, um, one of our presidents, um, John F. Kennedy, and I'm paraphrasing here, not using exact quote, he always said that we are of the sea, and when we die, we return to the sea. You know. <laughs> so, because of um, the, our own internal fluids, um, we do have, um, we're very much connected to the sea. We're very much connected to um, the tides and the moon. Um, I know there are some who will say otherwise, but uh, there is that pull there in our connection with the sea, whether we are inland or close to the coastline. Um, I have known some who have had no um, connection with the sea whatsoever. They've lived um, 
they've been landlocked. As soon as they uh, come into contact with it, there's like this amazing connection, this overall feeling of wildness, um, this untamable aspect. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I just love it. It's just beautiful. Now, um, we'll do is I think we'll tie it up, and then we've got a few more videos, at least two more. I think we have about a few more ideas of what we want to do with this um, for the next stage, which will be more about. Um, it's more personal work with the Selkie, won't it? It'll be more about integration, how to connect with your wild self. That's the next video we have planned. Yeah. Um, which is the uh, which is important because you need to start with yourself before you go out into the world. So starting with integration of the self and the, um, the Selkie, and then taking what you learn um, through that integration, and then bringing it out into the world. But also knowing that there is a dance between microcosmic forces and macrocosmic forces. So even though we are doing these videos next, being the integration of the self, and then the final one, um, unless deemed otherwise by our viewers, <laughs> um, there is that dance that happens going back to the self and then going back to society. You need to have both. You can't just stay compartmentalized in one box. There is that dance that goes back and forth between society and um, our own wild self. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is very exciting. Um, if before we go, is that um, obviously got you got a website on online? People can sort of see your work and you know you do many things. Your priestess and a doula and a herbal witch and many other very awesome things. Is there a space online that you can share with people that they can come and find you and connect with you if they want to? Yeah, I am. Um, you can find me online at my blog, which is www.alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A, Marie, M-A-R-I-E, Lavoie, L-A-V-O-I-E, at uh, blogspot.com. Awesome. I'll oh, remember to put it down here. We'll put loads of links down here, all places you want to, to go and have a look and um, and connect and find out more. Um, thank you so much, though, for sharing so much. It's really exciting, interesting, and beautiful wisdom today. And I look forward to our next interview, which is going to, I think we're going to power up next time, aren't we? Even more powering up. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you so very much. Um, I will learn. Uh, Say goodbye for now, but um, we'll be back very shortly. And if you have any questions, like if anyone wants to ask Alicia, Alicia any questions, um, do let us know on the YouTube, um, some message on YouTube or comment on YouTube. If you have any uh, questions, then we're going to maybe, if you guys are interested, uh, get all the questions together, gather them all together, and do a Q&A as well later. So if you have any questions about Selkie, about the myths, about integration, uh, do let us know. Um, you can put, put it in the comments below the video. Um, or send, send me a message, and we'll do a Q&A video later as well. So I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.